Good morning and welcome to the spectacular African bush vault. The sun is just about to pop over the horizon. My name is Brent Yosmith. I have Brian Joubert on camera sometimes as a, to get, as a team we're known as the Killer Bees. And it is going to be a spectacular sunrise safari. Jamie and Andrew to Joseph Francis are out on the other vehicle and Kirsten and Geraldine are in final control. So, yesterday we heard Tingona was just to the east of us, so I have have my fingers crossed checking the eastern boundary hoping to find those lovely big paw prints coming west towards Juma and it is a bit chilly this morning for, for us out here it's about 20 degrees Celsius which is I think 70 or early 80s Fahrenheit or early 70s I've, I've got confused but anyway it's chilly for us I know for a lot of you that's wonderfully warm and well done to the Broncos well there Brian and I called it yesterday uh, to have won the Super Bowl so hopefully you guys have all lines so there's lines roaring just over this crest Actually, quite close. Sounds like they might be on the move. And we set off after one big cat, and we're now listening to another. Oh, James is just getting hold of me on the game drive radio. Oh, I'll talk to him once I've finished listening. It didn't sound too far from here. I would guess about seven or eight hundred meters. So what we are going to do is I think we're going to carry on checking down Cheetah Cut Line, and then if we get no leopard tracks, we're going to head back here in case those lines are on the move. But at least we know there is definitely a big cat around. I'm just gonna let James know. James, James. James, um, I'll switch off on the cut line for that audio. Uh, it's probably about four, five hundred meters into Torchwood between pipe, that pipeline and the uh, fire break. It does sound like they might be mobile. Oh, I'm going to check Chile Cup Line down to Gary Main, then head back as they are mobile towards Chile Cup Line. Yeah, they're not moving. James is also going to come into the area. He's out on tracking team this morning and see if he can get some luck. So I'm guessing, or making an educated guess, if Tingana, the dominant male leopard, is either going to come in on one of the next two roads if he has come in at all. If not, I think he's still enjoying his time in the east, as are those male lions. More than certainly the Birmingham boys claiming their territory to all who wants to listen. Uh, Paul Rizzo says the Lions are shouting joyously for the Broncos winning the Super Bowl. I take it uh, Paul is a Broncos fan. Uh, and my con condolences to all the Panther fans out there. Oh, boom, 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 boom. Just double checking some tracks here, making sure Mr. Tingana hasn't managed to sneak onto the road. He hasn't. And sunrise looks like it's going to be quite spectacular this morning. A lovely pink hue forming on the clouds above. And I couldn't think of anything I'd rather be doing than taking all of you on a sunrise safari. I know most of you are really no 
know about this and I don't have to remind you, but just in case we've got a new viewer or three, uh, you can ask me about what's going on in the bush, uh, about what we're seeing, or if you've just wondered about anything in the bush, you can do that by popping me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or if you're a bit more tech savvy, just whack a hashtag in front of Safari Live and send out a tweet. Here is the pipeline road, and I think if the lines are moving west, they're going to be moving west straight down this road from where I heard them. Ah, no lion silhouette approaching us, unfortunately. So while we continue to peruse the eastern boundary, uh, Jamie has got probably one of the largest and smelliest birds out here in the African bush. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and what a spectacular morning it is proving to be. And there's nothing quite like the scenery that Africa provides, and in this case, the potential excitement that could be as a result of what we're seeing. So yesterday, James was trying to follow up on the lions, so was Brent, so was I, on tracking team in the afternoon. And I saw vultures, I went wandering into the block, but here we have a pair of white-headeds that have spent the night on the dead trees itself. The same, almost the same place, I think, where you finished off with James yesterday evening, surveying the land around them. Now the question is, of course, are they roosting here? Because, of course, vultures are allowed to rest sometimes. Or are they sitting waiting for their chance at a lion kill? <laughs> An angel lady has said that she will take the, li the lions over the Super Bowl excitement any day. For those of you who feel the same, you're in the right place. For those of you who are understandably excited about the Super Bowl, my congratulations to the Broncos, my commiserations for the Panthers. I might know, not know very much about what on earth it all entails, but coming from a South African background, we can all unite together in our understanding and excitement about sports games. Definitely know exactly what it's like to strongly support a sports team. Our South African heritage automatically dictates that we either watch rugby or cricket or both. And if the mood takes us football or soccer, there's nothing quite like. And the interesting thing is that there's a very useful comparison between sports games and what we do. Both are live, both could go Anyway, you can never really predict the exact outcome, even less so from our side. Good morning, Eric, who is watching in Virginia Beach. You were wondering, since these vultures are in the same tree that they were in yesterday, do they roost in the same tree? And yes, that's why they're in the same tree. The difficulty here is seeing vultures on dead trees, that's where they like to roost because they're big, bulky birds. They don't really like having to contend with leafy trees, having to negotiate those sorts of obstacles. They're built for long gliding tests of endurance, not really agility. And so in this case, they spent the evening perched on the dead tree. It also gives them a far better view of the world around them and that fierce piercing eyesight that can see four kilometers far better than our eyes can see. The only way we could match them is by putting binoculars to our eyes. And they're looking to see possibly if there's any descending vultures or just waiting for it to warm up so that they can start taking to the skies and fly along, glide along the thermals. That being said, there's a lot of vultures around here. There's some more further to the east of where we are and it does make me wonder whether or not there might be a lion kill. What we're looking for is vultures sitting in leafy trees, not necessarily the white-backed vultures sitting on the dead tree. We want to see the ones that are patiently waiting for the lions to depart. I've checked all of the surrounding waterholes, 
so they haven't come for a drink last night. And as we continue on forward, I will just say a quick good morning for those of you who don't know. My name is Jamie and I have Andrew on camera with me this morning. And we started off with not only, as Brent described it, one of the biggest, smelliest birds, but also one of the most endangered. Now, Brian was wondering what the vulture population is like out here. And the answer is, for the white-backed, it's fairly stable. But for something like a white-headed vulture, there's probably only about six of them in six breeding pairs, no, sorry, six, which equates to three breeding pairs within the greater Kruger area. And that is, of course, where we are coming to you live from. There are also, all vulture populations are under threat. It's the species that is heavily poisoned by a cage, although this is something that's slowly being um, stopped through educational programs. But in the past, there were a couple of approaches to farming in order to rid themselves of any kind of predator threat, which was to put down a poisoned carcass. Nowadays, that's very seldom coming from the farmers, but poachers, unfortunately, will do it. They'll put down poisoned carcasses that can kill 150, 200 birds at a time. And it's also fat-stored poison, so even if the bird recovers, as soon as they start to lose condition, they metabolize their fat and immediately release the poison back into their systems again. Now, in terms of our vulture populations, they are okay. There is a traditional belief, given they have that incredible eyesight, and by people not necessarily understanding how they operate. People assumed that they were predicting, could see into the future and were predicting where the next carcass was going to land, because they couldn't possibly understand how vultures somehow turned up at the carcass as quickly as they do. So it's led to the traditional belief that if you make a potion out of a vulture's brain, you will be able to see into the future. Now, while we search to see if there's any lions hiding around here, Brent has found some of their favorite food. As the sun creeps up on the horizon, we've come across a lonely wildebeest bull. So, not actually lonely, just lacking in ladies. So, wildebeest herds, the female herds, will move between multiple bulls' territories. And they'll defend the short grass areas like this against other bulls. And these are prime areas coming up for March when they start their rutting season. And they'll try herd ladies at that time to keep them within their quite small territories. There's normally about three or four hectares. And obviously the prime territories close to water on short grass panes are, are, the, are, the, are the real business territories. And the territories that are out on the peripheries, those guys don't get so lucky. And sometimes the bullies will increase their territory during the rutting season just to have the maximum chance at spreading their genes. So another reason why we've stopped a little bit further on down the eastern boundary and just listening to see if those lions decide to start calling again. And there you can see the sun just popping up above the horizon. Birds are starting to call in this beautiful dawn light. You know, a very vocal Cape turtle dove. Red crested Koran. To James Bear. James says, you guys get to drive through the African bushfolds and tell the wor world about its wonders. It must be the best job in the world. What are my feelings? Well, James, I'm afraid I have to agree with you 100%. It is possibly one of the best things to do in the world. Just being in the bush and being able to share it with as many people as we do is something spectacular. And hopefully we are breeding 
a new generation of conservationists while doing it. Oh, there's some impala also in that early morning light. So it's not uncommon to find the wildebeest hanging around with a herd of impala. And isn't that incredible? Nice, Brian. more sets of eyes to spot potential predators. Well, they carry on to get their daily nutrients. We're going to go carry on looking for our daily fix of big cats. Bright and shiny good morning to Love Three Dogs and a Love Three Dogs welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Uh, Love Three Dogs is wondering whether Scott and Nikki are on leave. Uh, that they are, they're taking a few days exploring the low fold of South Africa. And I'm sure Scott will come back with some great stories for you guys. Brian and I were discussing on the Sunset Safari whether we were going to get any rain. We were always hopeful for rain, but uh, Brian thought we were going to get it. I said, I don't think so much. And Kat uh, in Florida was wondering that, and Brian spotted what looks to be a little Warburg's eagle shooting across and um, big one. Uh, so we unfortunately didn't. As you can see, bright, clear skies. There is quite a large cloud bank off to the right here, yeah, to the west of us. But it is very high. It's a cloud called Cirrus, and that is mostly ice crystals and really, really unlikely to produce any rain. We need a much lower cloud bank to get sort of that set-in drizzle, um, all those big cumulus clouds to produce a nice big storm. Nice big Eddie Bull track here, but he's going the opposite direction to us. He's ducked in towards the Buffalo's Hook region, but uh, we'll go look for him after we've continued to check this area for tracks. Kristen's got quite an interesting question. Uh, Kristen's sitting in North Carolina, and Kristen's wondering, what is the lowest animal in our food chain out here? Which one doesn't stand a chance? Well, believe it or not, Kristen, even the, the animals right at the bottom of the trophic scale always have a chance. They've evolved to have defense mechanisms and strategies that will hopefully, for their, their sakes, help them avoid uh, being eaten. But you would probably look at your smaller creatures. And I think probably the guys who get eaten the most by everything uh, are your, your, some of your rodent species, uh, your mice and rats, as well as your sort of hares. So a hare will be eaten by the big cats, the small cats, the wild dogs, the birds, the owls, or the nocturnal birds and the diurnal birds. So your smaller rodents are generally right at the bottom of the, the, the trophic scale. And I mean, even for them, there's stuff below them on the trophic scale in terms of insects and grubs and worms. So it's a huge interlinked system in each little part and each little creature is an important little cog in that wheel uh, that we call the African spider. Now this is the next spot I was quite hopeful for leopard tracks.
much less. Maybe Mr. Tingana has found himself a lady friend or a meal to the east of us. We're just going to doubly check all the way down to the southern boundary. That's where the Styx lionesses were a few safaris ago, and they did have a kill quite close to there. So who knows, maybe they have meandered back towards us. If nothing there, we're going to head straight back towards that area we last heard the lions. We will take a slightly different route sure we haven't missed anything on Drakensberg Road. So we are going through a drought at the moment. We've had probably about 40% of our normal rainfall for this time of the year. And Brian is wondering how much rain would we need to fill up all the dams? Brian, probably more than we're going to get. Uh, I, I say we're looking for a, a very, very, very dry. Yeah, ah, unfortunately not. A predator track, but not the predator we're looking for. Brian, I'll get back to you in a second. Here we go. Spotted hyena tracks. Now, we'll find spotted hyena tracks all over the reserve every morning. They cover vast distances at night on their nightly forages, hunting expeditions. I would say in one foul swoop we probably need well over 150 millimeters to fill up the dams. But then it's always at the risk if you have that really big storm like that, that you might uh, have run away. So it might wash away some of the dam walls, which happens every, every now and then due to the lateritic soils we get here. But also because there's very little grass cover, a really big heavy storm can actually increase the drought. Even though you get that lot of rain, because there's no grass holding those soils together, it washes the topsoil off. So it can even lead to a much worse dry season. So it, it is one of those strange things now. We've got to a stage now where we, we sort of want soaking rain, a sort of heavy, heavy drizzle to light rain for a couple of days sort of soak the ground, really get the, the grass growing so their roots can bind together and hold the soils together. So if you've got a really big storm now, it would wash away a lot of that topsoil. But as I've been saying, drought is not as bad as a lot of people think it is. It is incredibly bad if you're a farmer. But you must remember that this is a, na a natural system and drought is part of nature. Of, we're going to have quite a lot of animals dying through this dry season uh, due to lack of condition, lack of food, lack of water. But the animals that do survive uh, come through with the best genetic code, so to speak. They're the survivors, the most hardy. And also, in these very dry times, we're going to have the predator populations increasing. It's a great time to be a lion, a leopard, or a wild dog, or a hyena. Lots of food around. So, Generally, the young and the old are going to be the first to go out of the, the herbivores. So even those little wildies and little impala that make it through this dry season will be the best to, to breed for next year and pass on the best set of genetics. And also, this is a way that nature controls itself. If an elephant population is too high, if an impala population is too high, a, a drought is a great natural leveler to bring those populations down. for that disappearance of Brent, that rather rapid disappearance. You'll notice that I am in the process of doing a U-turn. So I've been for a walk around the dead tree with the vultures. Nothing. There's no sign of lions. There's no smell of a kill. There's no growling from somewhere in the bushes. And I'm starting to wonder whether they just were not present at, present at another kill and have taken to resting somewhere close to wherever it was. I cannot see any vultures in the leafy trees. I can, however, hear ox pickers, which means there could well be something like buffalo wandering around here. The birds that sit on the back and pick off the ticks. 
And now the mystery remains. So yesterday, I found one track, one lioness track coming up this road. And the rest of them had been obliterated by the hippo walking between the pan and Sydney's dam. He walked all over it. The birds have been very upset this morning. Sorry, I'm just listening to alarm calls at the same time. They've been very disrupted and it was due to the presence of two African hawk eagles that soared past. African hawk eagles, of course, are notorious bird hunters. So I've walked all the way along here and across towards this dead tree as well, which is, once I get a nice view, I'll stop so you can see it's where the vultures are also resting. See, but now I think I do smell something here. Due to my puny human senses, I have to do a combination of all sorts of things in order to try and locate a lion kill, which includes stopping and listening. But for the vultures, they have a slightly easier job of things. And Robin, who's watching in Maryland, you're wondering, do they find it by sight or by smell? And the answer is by sight. Their binocular vision is capable of seeing far further than ours and they can fly up really, really high using thermals. Sorry, just bear with me one moment. Now, because I'm looking for lions, every log has turned into a sleeping lion. So Robin, yes, they look. And what the, the technique that they utilize is they fly up really high using the power of the rising air currents and observe, essentially, and as soon as one vulture spots a carcass and starts to descend, they will carry on, they will start moving into that area and descend as well and have a look to see whether there's anything worth, or anything interesting worth investigating. This is beautiful. Oh, big yawn. These exquisite birds are large and fairly long-lived. And Curtis was wondering what the lifespan of a vulture is. Now, I could stand corrected. As far as I know, it's somewhere around 10 years or even older. Now, the, the big birds generally tend to have much longer life expectancies than the smaller species of bird. Parrots, for example, can live easily up to 50, 60, 70 years. I think the natural lifespan in the wild would probably be somewhere in the region between 10 to 15, but Curtis, I'm actually honestly not 100% certain of that. I'll do it. I will have a double check and just make sure. I know that it takes them a, f a fair amount of time for all of the raptor species to actually reach their sexual maturity. Morning, hmm. He's <laughs> got something. Morning, Andrew. Uh, the question uh, is, uh, why are they here? Uh, I don't see any lions. I haven't seen them walking. I think that these vultures are just resting and it's a false alarm. And now the search continues to figure out where those lions did go. The Nkumas have pulled a mysterious disappearing act on us. The fact that we've also got, I know that yesterday James saw both hooded, whoopsie, I found a, I found a stump. Um, I know that yesterday, James had spe different species of vulture. Andrew just giving us a, a quick windscreen. Thank you, Andrew. Windscreen wipe. Spiderwebs. Spiderwebs. The joys of summer driving. And this has been a very mild spider year in comparison to the other years that I've been in the bush. There've hardly been any. Hmm. Oh dear, I think I'm trying to make a lion sighting. I'm trying to wish a lion sighting into existence here. I don't think there is one. There are also absolutely no hyena tracks around, which to me suggests, and it's very close proximity to the den, which to me suggests that it's unlikely that there's something here, because even if the lions were still here and still feeding, the hyenas would still have come across to investigate. And particularly, they're about, we're about 
300 odd meters from that active den site. So I think that they would have come already to have a good sniff around and investigate the presence of the lions. Here's another one. Goodness me. I've said that and now I'm not so sure because it looks like we've got a juvenile white-headed here. Hmm, this is very interesting. Oh no, it is a white-backed, sorry. Thought it was a, it's a juvenile white-backed. Oh, <laughs> Drongo thought about it. <laughs> thought about mobbing the vulture and then realized it was a vulture and of absolutely no threat to it. Goodness me. Is there a patch of vultures that I've missed? Are they hiding somewhere in leafy trees? Are these just the stragglers? I don't think so. I think they've just chosen to roost here and they've come down together from a thermal and just happened to end up in this particular position. Now the vultures that we're looking at are fairly large in size. You can see they've got nice dense, nice thick bills that are used to rip open carcasses. But Kim B, you were wondering, do they have a hierarchy in terms of the way that they feed at carcasses? And yes, to an extent, in the same way that any kind of animal or any kind of predator out here has a hierarchy. And what I mean by that is the biggest vultures get the best access to food. Now there's different levels of feeding for these vulture species. The lappet face vultures, the really large, powerful, we, they, we sort of term them the tin openers. They've got the thickest beaks of any of the vultures and they're very large, very powerful birds. They get first access to the carcass and they will be able to open up the tough skin. That's something like a hooded vulture would be completely incapable of doing. And then because they're bigger and bulkier, they'll be the first to feed at carcasses, along with the white-backed vultures, and sometimes cape vultures. Every now and again, cape vultures are a species that's much more um, isolated to the mountains. It's also much more endangered. However, they do occasionally cruise through. And everywhere I look, I see birds of prey. No, this is ridiculous. Maybe I have missed something. <laughs> It's one of those frustrating things because you don't want to spend too much time. This is very far away, back a bit, forward a bit. Boom. Thank you, Andrew. Oh no, there's got to be something here. With another vulture and what looks like a Wahlbergs. Now very often birds of prey will scavenge, not just vultures. But sorry, just to finish off with Kim's answer, the hooded vultures will be the last in line. We don't have a hooded vulture here at the moment, but they will be the ones that feed, feed at the end with their small beaks. They're basically the toothpicks of the vulture family. But watching vultures feed around a carcass is a truly spectacular experience. They cluster around, they screech at each other. Well, that one nearly dislodged the where are you going? Are you just here to warm up or is there a lion kill somewhere? I think it might require another walk. I think I need to go wander through this block one more time. Maybe I've just missed them lying up under a bush or something like that. So while I go for a quick walk in the bush, let's pop back over to Brent and get an update from his side. So no tracks, unfortunately. So we're heading back to where we heard those lions. That any bull track did cut across towards the, what is now empty Buffalo's Hook water hole. So I'm just gonna go back up onto the eastern boundary and have a little listen. Hopefully those Birmingham boys are on the march. So I seem to have a look at this a little bit more carefully. There seems to be a drag mark coming down the road here. It's going to make sure that it's not a leopard dragon. It's a hyena drag. Ah, 
I didn't actually have to get out for that. And I spotted the hyena track quite shortly there, so I'm going to have to reposition. So I can tell you why this is a hyena drag. I'm just going to have a double, double check. Yeah. So either stolen or hunted, very difficult to say when you just find a drag mark. But something moved on to the next plane last night and the hyenas are taking advantage of it. Something's been dragged down the road. And if we have a look carefully, mm, there, where's that hyena track? Uh, let's try to find a slightly clearer one, I think. Can you find a nice clear one there, Brian? I think probably a bit further out's gonna be easier. And there we go. So we can see the shape there, the pointy, you can see the claws sticking out. So not a leopard, but a hyena, but it could possibly have stolen this kill from a leopard. Might be worth just having a quick squiz where it's come from and see if there are any leopard tracks at the end. And uh, we have found a very strange beast who's looking a little bit sheepish, uh, hiding behind his sunglasses on this bright and sunny morning. Oh, he's taking his sunglasses off at the, at the mention of sunglasses. Enjoying some alone time in the bush, tracking uh, Commander Bond. Morning, Gen Z. Hello. It's been about 20 minutes since I last Hello, saw you. Everyone. Um, I think those lions, unfortunately, decided to go down. Deep east. Not deep east, close east. Uh, they must have been a couple hundred meters from us when they started calling. And no tracks Tingana coming out from there, just the hyena drag mark. Ah, well, where's it going? It's going that way. I'm going to go back towards in case there was a leopard on the other end. I think it might have been thieved, right. yes. Okay. Well, Harry, good luck. Thank you. Viva la France. Viva la France. Oh, look at this guy's right next to us. <laughs> Hiding under this little bush willow is a scrub hare. Um. And James found it for us. He tracked a scrub hare this morning. You can see. There we go. And we have been having some great sightings of them, and that's due to this drought we're having. There's not so much cover for them to hide in, even though they do have wonderful camouflage. And you can see that very light-colored fur around the eye, and that really large eye that's indicative of nocturnal animals. But shame, he's probably a little bit stressed, wondering that how we possibly spotted him. So we don't want him to move out from his cover. So we're going to leave him be and carry on and see what else we can find. Hi, Jamesy. Hi. Bye, James. Bye. That's the thing about the bush. If you look a little bit carefully, there is always something really interesting to see. in this wonderful large ecosystem and unfortunately anywhere where they're humans sometimes things go a little bit awry and Eric in Virginia Beach is wondering if there are any invasive plant species or invasive species that are upsetting the natural balance. Uh, not too much in this area, there are a few invasives but they haven't become incredibly bad yet and, and they haven't sort of taken over areas. One of the worst ones is that, that quite a pretty flower called a red star zena uh, that occurs on the short grass areas and sometimes blocks out the indigenous grass species. But a drought like this is also good for controlling those invasives that like quite a lot of water. The other ones, other invasives I've seen, there are a few prickly pear plants about. And see from the tracks where James has come from. He's come from where those lions were calling. So let's move towards the, the remnants of the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. See if there's any tracks come out in that area. So Eric 
None of them that really affect the balance too much, but there are the odd invasive plant species uh, and bird species, actually. Probably one of the worst ones. I saw one in the Sabi Sand, which is a first for me. It's called an Indian miner. It is a, a starling species native to India. A uh, very, very clever bird. It can be taught to talk like a parrot. Uh, and they are real, real pains in the attack indigenous bird nests and stuff break them down and dominate any food source. But what happens when any of these things are seen, there, are, 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 there is a program to remove them, especially with the invasive plants and with the Indian miners. African bush, everything's not as simple as we would like it to be. And Ben in Leesburg is wondering about hyena, hi, I mean predator hierarchies. There's no, he knows lions are sort of top of the food chain, but can I explain hyenas and wild dogs' position? Whoa, the chair just broke. <laughs> Hang on a second, let me try and fix it. There we go. Um, well, Ben. Lions are by far the top of the sort of trophic pyramid. They are the apex predator. And if we had to go back a couple of thousand years, uh, they shared that top court of the, tri of the triangle with human beings. But we'll just discuss us, our uh, lions for now and leave us for later. So lions are top, hyenas are second on that on that scale. And then you, depending on situation, wild dogs possibly third, uh, and then then comes leopard, and then finally cheetah. Now, the reason wild dogs, even though they are so slightly built in that, jump up above animals like leopard and cheetah is because they're a social animal. So a group of wild dogs can easily deal with uh, a single leopard, but a single wild dog would not be able to deal with a single leopard. But they, they jump up a few notches due to the fact that they're a social predator, and Hyenas, in terms of size, are second to the to the lions. Even though occasionally you will get an individual male leopard who's bigger. Again, a one-on-one -on -one will probably maybe leave with the leopard winning. But as soon as there's a second hyena, again, but being social, they jump. Now lions are physically bigger and they're a social predator, so that immediately pops them up at the top. Uh, although a group of hyenas will definitely give a small pride of lions a good go for their money as long as there's no male present. As soon as there's a male, an adult male lion present, hyenas get out of dodge. Uh, male lions are so much bigger and so much physically stronger that uh, even 12 hyenas would not think about taking on a fully fit adult male lion. And in certain parts and certain individuals, I can just remember all animals can be slightly different. Uh, in northern Botswana, we had a male lion who had the most... I, I've never seen an animal with such hatred for another animal. So a lot of male lions will half-heartedly chase hyenas off and that. This male lion actually actively hunted hyenas. And the one morning we went out and literally along the main road to the middle of the concession, um, there was five dead hyenas and he'd literally walked down the road and everywhere he'd come across hyenas he'd stalked and killed it so he just really didn't like hyenas it's possible he might have been harassed as a young male in his nomadic days by hyenas to such an extent that he just literally uh, wanted to kill them all never feeding on them here we are there's the remnant of the buffles hook water hole not much there and he's snorting at us very strange. Just gonna have a quick look at those impala. Huh? Uh, just judging from their behavior, I think they might have smelled something and that's what they're snorting at, rather than actual snorting at us. They are looking a little bit nervous, but they don't really know where to look. So maybe they've smelt a leopard. sure about something. Let's try to 
because he they don't seem to be snorting in one particular direction they seem to be snorting in multiple directions and they're unsure of where the possible threat is it's a very still morning not much breeze they seem to be a little bit more focused back behind them Have a look on the other side of the dry dam. So while we check very carefully around here, let's hop on with Jamie. She's got an update for you guys. And while Brent checks carefully around, I have done exactly the same thing and I'm now convinced that the vultures are a false alarm and that there are no lions in this block. I walked up and down and I discovered to my, oh no, there's tracks coming in here. <laughs> These are not fresh though, or are they? I feel now like a little bit like I'm going mad. Oops, and apparently can't drive either. <laughs> Andrew loving it in the back. I walked into that block, all I found was a herd of, or a pride of hornbills, and one buffalo. Why are there now tracks coming down here? They're not fresh though. That is a, in a way, I don't know whether that's a comforting thought or not. I don't think we can see any, any from here. Oh goodness gracious, one more trip, one more trip around. Determination is key. I checked under the dead tree where the, it wasn't a Warburgs by the way, it was a snake eagle, where the snake eagle was sitting with that vulture. I checked under where the juvenile vulture was. Nothing moved, nothing growled. I didn't hear anything apart from hyenas calling towards the den. These lions have gone under the radar this morning. Okay, put ourselves in the mind of the animal. If they do have a kill, they would have been thirsty. The nearest water is Galago Pan. I've checked Galago Pan already this morning, but it might be worth doing another double check around that side again. It's a tricky one, trying to figure out exactly what's happened. My suspicion is that we might have missed a kill at some point in the last few days, and it might even have been a small one. So it might even have been in the space of 12 hours that they finished it off and moved on. The vultures congregated, finished off what was left of it, and then decided to roost in the trees around it. It's just peculiar that there's lion tracks on that patch of road. I drove that road yesterday and I didn't see any tracks there. Chatting a little bit about, oops, mind the millipede. Chatting a little bit about vultures, which we have been seeing plenty of this morning, leading us hopefully to lions. Kristen was wondering what the difference is between the vultures in South Africa and the vultures elsewhere in the world. And Kristen, I have to be honest, I think most, of, there's a very similar design structure. They'll have resistance to different types of diseases. So our vultures in particular are very, very resistant to anthrax. Now I really feel like I'm going loopy. This is deja vu. In the tree, and I can't get any closer because it's very skittish. This is the second time. Remember this morning, I said to you that there were African hawk eagles around. There he goes. Both times, they've been sitting on the ground. Well done, Andrew. It talent, takes a talented cameraman to pull off feats like this. What are you going to do? They're obviously after something that's on the ground here. Awesome, well done, Andrew. Let's go and investigate what they're after around the termite mound. This is serious deja vu. This is how I started my morning. They were being mobbed by drongos and they took off from this exact spot. And every bird species in the world has just flown past me. <laughs> A starling, one of the cysticulars, flycatchers. Oh my word, it's so bright in there. What are they after? 
This is maybe a termite, a flying ant explosion. It shouldn't be. Hello, Starling. Good morning. Chup, chup. Hmm. I almost feel like doing a stakeout around this termite mound. Grab my binoculars. Oh, little flycatcher there. Very difficult in this light. I think it's a spotted. Hold on, no, it's not. It's one of the canaries, I think. Looks like one of the canaries. There's something. Oh, Sisticula is shouting at me. Drongos as well. They are picking away at something around the termite mound. It must be, there must be some kind of insect population explosion happening here. The fact that there were birds of prey around. It's odd though, because there hasn't been any rain. Usually the flying ant or the reproductive termites only come out just after the rain. Sorry guys, bear with me one moment while we try and figure out what these birds are up to. Let me just get hold of Brent. Brent standing by. Jamil, where are those last tracks? Coming down the Gallagher shortcut, shortcut, um, straight towards where the vultures were. I copy, um, <laughs> Brent is going to come and try and give me a hand with this. This is getting ridiculous. And especially if he finds them before I do, then I'm going to be really annoyed. <laughs> then I will never hear the end of it. Hmm. I'll go and do a walk in that area as well. Here we go, James is coming to walk. All of us are walking around this area. And I'm still not entirely sure whether or not they're leading us in a, on a merry dance through the morning and have moved off completely. I still, I just feel like by now, the way that I've wandered through the zigzags I've done through the bush, I either should have seen them, they would have got up and moved away, or there would have been a little growl just to let me know that they're there. I haven't had either. And James Francis has got another suggestion. What if the killer's in the tree and I'm so busy looking on the ground? James, I hope I would have spotted it, but it's a good point. And it's so bright this morning that I've been walking with my hand next to my head to try and... No, you see, I, I keep getting a whiff. I'm starting to feel a little bit ridiculous. I keep getting strange hints that these lions are here somewhere. If nothing's tying together, maybe James Francis has hit upon the answer and they're actually scoping out the trees. I hope I would have seen it. But I have to confess, when you're looking for lions, when you suspect that there are lions and you're looking for a kill on the ground, you tend to focus your attention on the ground. So maybe, who knows? I'm going to do one more walk around in this block just to make sure because I think if Brent or James finds them first, I'm going to have to go home and have some rejuvenating coffee. <laughs> so while I go and walk about, let's pop over to Brent and get an update from him. So with no tracks in the east, we're gonna go give Jamie a hand uh, around Gallagher shortcut. Uh, and I guess she doesn't want James or I to find them first, so she's off on foot again. Just have a look down there. I think it's just a stick. It is just a stick, but always worth double checking. So we're going to be going really slowly now. This road's very hard. It's one of the main access roads in and out of the north. So it makes tracking a little bit more difficult. So we're gonna literally ride along uh, our northern edge of our travels. So these old tracks, but they're definitely lions. 
time tracks. is we had a little bit of drizzle last night night before last so i'm looking at this track and i'm trying to age it now and i'm going to say it's quite fresh there's no drizzle marks on it and if i had to put my hand it's quite hard sand so this line's pushed like this let's try a bit softer wet. if you look at my finger track there also there is a bit of wind it was very windy last night so the edges aren't as sharp, but there are line tracks there. Where they go from here is obviously the next question. Do they go across north or do they sneak back into Juma? We just gonna turn around and have a look at these tracks go. Stuff. These lions have been playing games with us for a day or two now. Florida is saying lions and leopards blend so well with their surroundings. How often do I think we have driven right past them? Probably more often than we'd like to admit, Ron. I'm just going to update Jamie and James. Oh, here comes James. The ground's quite hard over here. What I might do is I might hand this on to James so he can get out the car and, and look a bit more carefully. And I might check just down here. There's James here. I'm going to send him to come up. James, uh, he's out in trucking team, so he's going to be able to spend a lot more time on foot following these tracks, so it makes life easier for us. You must remember, finding animals is a team game. There's tracks for at least one, but it looks like a male. Oh, there's the gang. It's uh, just over that hump, coming down the road, but it comes onto this hard stuff, and I can't really see. I think maybe if you walk, you'll probably have a better chance okay. than me from the car. I'm going to check Gary Cutline. There was a male yesterday that I saw. Yeah, so there, there, there are tracks there. But I can only see tracks of one. Jamie's got some around Aubrey's Gallagher. No, that shortcut, the second shortcut off Gallagher. Okay, shortcut. Where? Um, into the block towards Mvugu, where those vultures are. The block towards Mvugu? Yeah, that, where that drainage line is, just to the north of the hyena den. How fresh do you think these ones are? Last night. There's no, none of that drizzle stuff on it, but it's, it was really windy last night, so the edges aren't that sharp. If you had gone straight down here, we, one of us would have picked it up now. So I'm just going to have a quick gander around here. I did here. drive this road, and I was sort of fiddling with my camera, so I may have missed the other Okay, I'll have a quick look. <laughs> Double check carefully. James is going to jump out of his car so he can have a, a look on foot. Uh, we will check very carefully now. And as Ron was saying, they could be lying right here.
check very, very carefully. Very slowly. Now, James is admitted to driving down this road, so obviously it makes it a little bit difficult. And sometimes in that really early morning, when we get going and we're still operating with lights, it is possible to, to miss a track or two. I'm just gonna get hold of Jamie, see if she's back on the vehicle, they don't know. See if she's got tracks of, uh, I think this is a male line, but if, if she thinks she's got female tracks, so there's definitely only one set of tracks here. Jamie, Jamie. tracks of what looks to be a single male at Gary Cutline Junction with uh, Buffalo's of Cutline. I've showed James where they are. He's going to go have a look on foot around there. I'm going to check Gary Cutline back towards uh, Central. Those tracks you had there earlier with Elvin, uh, Lioness or Male. Okay, so that's good. Jamie's got tracks for Lioness, so it's possibly different uh, from this. And if they did have a kill where those vultures are, the, the lions, the lion might have come in and had the lion's share, and the lionesses have been abandoned. No, it's always worth checking carefully and there's three of us in this area now so that's twice the chance we'd have if there was just one of us looking so jamie's on the other side of this block from us james is on the northern boundary and we're going down along the east and then to the south A rogue has started a poll. Who will find the lions first? Well, Chris, I think James has possibly got the best chance, but don't tell him I said that. Being able to spend long, long, a longer period on foot in the block always increases your chances of finding those animals. But I have the luck on my side, and Jamie's right on the spot. She's got tracks. We are hitting and hoping here at the moment, but who knows, maybe the luck is with Brian and I. So let's go and think, see what Jamie thinks of who's going to find the Lions first goal. And we'll be back a little later. The race is on for all of us now. I think, and I've been think I've been doing a lot of serious thinking this morning. I think that the lionesses have finished that kill. The reason I think that is because the vultures are all scattered. All of the birds of prey that we've seen have been resting in dead trees, not sitting uncomfortably tucked up in the leafy trees like they very often do around lions on a kill, which makes me think that they've fed already. And as Andrew pointed out, actually, Andrew's ranger skills coming through, Andrew's pointed out that they've got very full crops as well, which I think all of the combination of those factors suggest to me that they have eaten already and moved off. So now it becomes a game of where did the lions go next? I'm on my way to Sydney's dam to go and check there. Presumably you all would have told us if they'd made their way down to the Juma Dam camera sometime last night. They haven't been around the Galago Pan because I checked there early this morning. The only other water that I can think of in the immediate vicinity is Sydney's dam. Unless of course they've crossed into Buffles Hook somewhere around here and move to one of the larger dams to the north. But I do think it's really worth checking around to the west. And amazingly, in the space of, uh, what time is it? In the space of an hour, it's probably easily gone up about seven or eight degrees Celsius. It's already boiling. It's amazing. It's going to be a scorcher of a day. I think those clouds and that heavy sky ahead of us is bringing false, are bringing false promises once again. I think they're going to blow up towards the north.
And Siberia thinks they are still between Mvubu Road and Gauri Cut Line. The block I'm looking in is Galago Shortcut and Vubu, so between those two roads. Do I think that they're still there? Maybe. Honestly, your guess is as good as mine. The tracks have di immediately disappeared off into the block. My personal opinion is that they're not, they're not from early this morning. I am still going to check around there, I promise. James is wandering around checking for that male lion that Brent found tracks of. It's all a bit of a race. The problem with that block is that it is enormous. So you can wander through. If they decide to go flat under a bush, lie down, full beddies, get some shade, and you walk past within sort of 50 meters of them, short of doing proper grid search, which we don't have time for, well, not necessarily don't have time for, but I don't want to be off the vehicle for that extended period of time, it becomes very tricky. I mean, could we be hiding? Well, be right, Siberia Zumi. That may be exactly where they are, lying up in the shade. And Sandy, who is also playing detective as well, and very successfully so. Yesterday, Madam, the matriarch of the hyena clan, was behaving very strangely on James's drive and was on clearly on alert. And you were wondering if maybe that was because the lions were close with a kill and now there's lots of vultures around. Sandy, that is entirely possible. That's my next is to go and investigate the hyena den because maybe we might find remnants of it. There's a chance that they've already managed to either divest the lions of the kill itself or gone to pick up the scraps and the remainders. I keep getting a sound, but every, time, but every time I follow it, I don't find any sign of a kill or tracks. We've come to Sydney's Dam, what's around the corner? One, two, Impalas. <laughs> Not the lions though. Checking carefully in the shade. Oh, awesome. There you go. Impalas. And two, what look like large egrets or great egrets. They've got that hunched shoulder posture. One of the larger species of egret, it's very far away. No lions though. And I think James Richard is absolutely right. The lions have been taking lessons from the Queen of Juma, disappearing. They're here somewhere, they've got to be. There's no tracks crossing Buffles Hook cut line. I think that maybe our next step is to just double check to the west in case they decided to wander towards Simbabili and then check the hyena den. Between the three of us, surely, surely, we must find them. If they are here, we shall find them. view of the morning. <laughs> Sherry said that I've entered a time travel nightmare, um, which is almost accurate because I did exactly the same loop and encountered exactly the same thing, just with slightly different light. But Sherry has suggested that maybe the odds are not in my favor this morning, doing everything that we know how to do and just not yielding the results that they should be. Ah, but the morning is not over yet. We're only an hour and a bit in. We've still got another two to figure out where these cats have gone. Thank goodness. 
awareness, of course, that I have your, your, <laughs> the help of the viewers, Kevin Catfish has provided a very useful description of what lions look like, which <laughs> I appreciate. Andrew's having a chuckle on the back there. So Kevin has told us that we are looking for a large cat, sort of golden in color. The males apparently have big, dark, sort of fluffy heads. There's the hair all around them. What's it called again? Um, mane. It's called a mane. And you can distinguish the males from the females in that way. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Perhaps we should draw up one of those wanted posters. Missing. If found, please call Jamie. <laughs> Reward offered. Payment will be made in jokes and shenanigans and possibly a cup of coffee if you're lucky. Or Zim Dollars. Or Zim Dollars. <laughs> you, Andrew. <laughs> oh, this is ridiculous, man. They've got to be here somewhere. I will be distinctly put out if Brent finds them before I do again this morning. Now while we travel along and you obviously had a glimpse of both the uniform that Brent and myself are wearing, and probably every now and again have occasionally caught glimpses of guests on the backs of vehicles. Kristen was wondering, is there a reason that people always, there we go, Andrew's providing his, his contribution to the uniform conversation. <laughs> the neutral olive green of the Wild Earth, very, very pleasant Wild Earth jackets. Beautifully windproof. Andrew, I don't know how you're still wearing a jacket, though. It's hot. It's very warm. But Krista would like to know, why do we wear neutral colors? And the answer is... <laughs> Nearly threw Andrew off the vehicle. Hey, little one. You gave me a fright. <laughs> Hello. Maybe not as big a fright as we gave him. The little speaks hinge tortoise. Racing off the road. He was tucked right down. He looked just like a log or a rock. <laughs> Seeking refuge. He was too neutrally coloured. <laughs> to carry on with Kristen's question. Here he goes, disappearing. Trying to bulldoze his way into this vegetation by sheer determination. Push, come on, you can do it. In you go. Look at that. And I think that little tortoise is saying a big phew. Important to have eyes in the back of your head, even if you're turning around to talk to camera. Oh. Hold on, Rusty. Okay, little tortoise. Have a good morning. <laughs> so, Kristen, neutral coloured clothing. There's, there's a couple of reasons. One, of course, is that for most animals that see, not as necessarily, they can see in colour to an extent, but mostly in grayscale, they don't have the same number of cone cells as we do within their eyes, so they don't interpret colour quite as well as we do, unless you're talking, of course, about birds or the primate species, which have perfect colour vision. And there's certain colours that stand out more than others within the bush. So one is the whites, so a white shirt, anything like that, that might show up more clearly and things with large stripes and then black as well although not as clearly as white does and we also do it because it's a it's a safari standard to wear a uniform to wear those neutral colors is just more professional I don't necessarily think that it hides you any better from the animals and the reason I say that is because actually they're far more reliant on their sense of hearing and their sense of smell than they are 
on any other sense. So it's not really to hide you from the animals, but it is just to reduce your impact on the world. But if you see a, a, a guest coming through wearing white clothing, it, they are so, the animals are so accustomed to people driving through and wearing those different colored clothing that they don't really, it doesn't really impact them on it in any kind of way. So generally we will stick with neutral. We don't always necessarily have to wear either khaki or green in color. For example, I know that Brent likes to wear gray and dark blue. Also works absolutely perfectly. So it's a combination of practical impact and then actually quite honestly the image of what it is we're wearing. You don't really want to be guided by a safari guide that's wearing, I don't know, bright pink or bright, yeah, bright pink polka dots, exactly. It doesn't really inspire faith in the professionalism of that individual. Imagine if I took your safaris wearing bright pink. Not of course that I own any bright pink clothing, but let's, let's suspend our disbelief for a moment and just uh, picture it. Kirsty says I'm lying and that I do, and she's right, I am. <laughs> I do have one item of very pink clothing. I don't know where it is. <laughs> but yes, it is, it's a combination of reasons. through. No, they don't. You're right. They really don't. They've been sleeping here. They've been sleeping here while we've been walking in the block. No, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is where they spent the night, ladies and gentlemen, on Aubrey's Road. You sneaky, sneaky cats. Okay, so they're not still in the block. Interestingly, some of these tracks look enormous. Hold on one moment, I just need to call this in. Standing by. Jamie, I'm on a vehicle accident. Do you have a direction for those tracks here? I'm just trying to work it out. I didn't pick it up further up for your teller access. Um, and it doesn't look as though they've gone up Aubrey's. Just give me a moment. Brent is on his way. Now we really are in a race. So this, <laughs> let me just give you a rough idea of what's happening here. It also gives me, if I can untangle myself in a moment, here we go, I'm quite cabled up in this vehicle. It also gives me a moment to get an idea of which direction these tracks went into. So, the lions, thought I was about to pull a Scott Dyson moment and have them lying right there, heard a noise. So the lions, here last night. All of this flattened ground is from them lying down. And I am actually checking care. It wouldn't be the first time I've done that. They've walked all the way up the road. Where did they go? Where have they gone to? For lion tracks, this is probably one of the best examples. And the way that she stood, She's actually splayed out quite significantly, which is why this track looks so big. But you can see four toes, one, two, three, four. Back racing in our direction and track off this way. Well done, Andrew, well spotted. Where, which Oh no, Brent and I are on the same, in the same place now. It really has become an even playing field race. All right, bear with me one moment. I'm going to... Okay, up this way. They've gone up. That way. <laughs> Brent sneaking past, racing ahead of me. That is so annoying. Oh, no. He's got a head start. Look at, look at him go. <laughs> He's already raced past us. Oh. Uh... Come on, Gears. Oh dear, okay. Um, let's just figure out where Brent's going to go. Brent, what route are you gonna take? Uh, 
Yeah, that's what I thought because I didn't pick up any further on. Um, I'm just going to check Aubrey's just in case they popped up here. Now, if I were feeling particularly um, naughty, I might send Brent off in completely the wrong direction and take the lions all for myself. But in the spirit of teamwork and actually being able to show the lions to you, I'm not going to do that. Where are you? Uh, Jamie, I saw a Why don't you check Sandy Patch from Aubrey's High Power to Jim Father Road? I got a feeling they are heading towards Sydney, so. Copy, I've just come from Sandy Patch. I actually think they might be in the block still, in the middle, um, and that they're still wandering through. Copy. They're on their way to Sydney's. We're just one step ahead of them, or one step behind them, depending on at which point you happen to meet up with us as we drive along the road. When we were on Sandy Patch with the tortoise, we were one step ahead of them. Uh, on Aubrey's, which is where we are now, we're one step behind. Sherry was right, it is a time loop. Oh my goodness. Their tracks haven't come out of this road. They must be walking straight through the middle of this block. And I know where they pop out if they do that. Come on, everybody, keep your eyes peeled. Never going to hear the end of it. Andrew's saying something. <laughs> and while we continue on our search, and Andrew does some sign language to me because my comms have disappeared, <laughs> I'm going to send you back over to Brent. So it seems like Jamie has sent me in the wrong direction. I can't see any tracks here. No, I'm only joking. Uh, Jamie's going to check a little bit further to the sort of north. And we're just going to check here on the western front. Again, going nice and slowly. The weather seems to be playing up a little bit. Temperatures dropped, winds picking up. Brian thinks there's a cold front on the way. And here's that wall of cloud coming. Wait, let me just get into a gap. Here we go. And a wall of cloud approaching us. following up uh, it makes life a lot easier we can cut cut off areas and make our search area smaller and smaller as we continue Kristen's wondering how far are we from Durban KwaZulu Natal uh, Kristen quite far to drive is possibly about 800 kilometers or so. We've got an update from Jamie. At the tracks change direction, so we're going to do the same. Um, to drive is about 850, 800, 850 kilometers. Um, but as the crow flies, obviously a bit closer. That's it. It is quite far from us. Um, so that. Uh, while there, to drive, you actually have to drive around Swaziland. You can drive through Swaziland, but of course, always crossing borders is a, a painstaking affair in most parts of Lyons. So there we go. And I told you, I have the luck. There we go. Stations located in Kumangara, four of them Impala Road, about 250 meters from the junction with 
uh, we're to access animals on mobile west towards triple m jamie would you like to come join There we go, then Kahuma girls, it looks like four again, so we have had three of them for quite a while. So nice to have four again, and the fifth one is still with the Birmingham boys, uh, entertaining. Look, you can see they've got their belly quite full, she's definitely eaten something. Nice to get them moving while it's still cool rather than doing what lions normally do, which is sleep for about 20 hours a day. Ah, and they've spotted some impala. The impala haven't yet spotted them. But they definitely had a decent meal. Not completely rotund, but definitely everyone's showing a bit of round roundness in the belly. Definitely then Kahumas. There's a herd of impala off that they're looking at. Not looking too seriously though. And it looks like they've got quite a nice belly on them. The only thing I am a little bit worried about the direction they're heading, the closest water in the direction they're heading is unfortunately out of our traverse zone. Negative just come straight down in Parlor Road from Vertel Access. You know, get us visual. They're lying in the middle of the road now. Yeah, a squirrel who's quite upset. And look there, there's some aloe grooming going on as they move past. Ooh. Unhappy squirrel. He's telling everyone there's a l -l 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 lion. L -l 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 lion. Unfortunately, it seems the squirrel's got a bit of a stutter. So I definitely can't take all the credit for these lines. It was definitely a team operation and being able to have more than one vehicle in an area and find out where they're not is just as important as finding out where they are. and have a little rest oh in the road so only five individuals left in this pride now the fifth one is away mating with Bir a birmingham male and we went through a long period of not seeing this pride at all and fantastic that they're back Lapa is wondering, how is the lioness with the limp? Well, this, um, I didn't notice any particular limp, and it's very common to see lions limping or being a bit stiff. Being a lion is, is, is not the easiest job in the world, and especially when you're hunting large creatures like buffalo, they often pick up little injuries, but their constitution is so amazing that they recover really quickly from them. You can see a little bit of social grooming happening at the moment very important in any social predators routines because quite often with lions they forget that they're friends while they're eating and they will literally beat the absolute snot out of each other uh, afterwards it's time for a bit of tender loving care to reaffirm those pride bonds
elephant, sorry. I just heard an elephant trumpet in the distance as well. So there was a young male that was affectionately known to, as Junior to a lot of our viewers. And Siberia, one of our Zoomies, is wondering, is there, do, you think I, do I think he'll come back? Because the B-Boys are far away. Well, the Birmingham boys are probably between where he is now and, and here, so I think it's very unlikely that he's going to come back. Um, he stayed a lot longer with the pride than what a young male normally does. So I think it's very, very unlikely that he'll come back. And here comes Jamie and Andrew. I'm just snapping a few pictures. Isn't it lucky we turned around when we did and came back and it popped out next to the road with us? So I think Jamie's been working very hard with these lines for most of the morning and we've just come in at the end to swoop the glory. And she's pulling tongues at us now. Uh, Jamie has worked incredibly hard to find these lines, so I think I'm going to leave her with the lines. And I'm going to go follow up on those elephants we heard trumpeting. So while we do that, let's jump on with Jamie and leave her with the lines. And I'm going to go see if we can find us some Ellie's. Good morning, ladies. And Brent, oh, is he leaving? Not entirely sure that's... He did find them, oh well. I was going to go... <laughs> oh, that was very kind. I was going to crawl off to the hyena den and lick my wounds. Good morning. Yes. Leaving one station with the performers <laughs> on a parlor road, best access. <laughs> oh, that was very kind. Hey, look at that. We've been looking for you all morning, ladies. You've been dodging us. I can't believe that happened. He shot past us so fast. <laughs> Hello, Amber Eyes. Oh, well, at least I was right about the fact that they'd left. There is some comfort in that, that the fact that they weren't still in the block and that the kill was gone. It is a comforting thought on this morning in which I lost another race to the Lions, to Brent. <laughs> You big girls. Nice to see the four of them together again. Last time I saw them, it was only three. And Ashley, who's watching in Alabama, you were wondering how many sub-adults there are within the Uncahuma Pride now. So in front of us, oh, she's so gorgeous, that lion. Those eyes are incredibly striking. Look at you, beautiful thing. Ashley, you were wondering about the sub-adults. Now, the four of them are, it's a combination of three adults and one sub-adult female. I think it's the one at the back behind Amber Eyes that is the sub-adult. Oh, no, sorry, my mistake. I think it actually might be the one on the left. It's hard to tell when they're just a pile of flat lines. Yes, I think it's the one on the left. So, Ashley, there, when I first started working, <laughs> rolling around. No, that's the adult. That must be the one behind. She's just hidden from me. When I first started, the Nkuhumas had three sub-adults, if you count junior. So there was one sub-adult male and two sub-adult females. With the arrival of the Birmingham boys and the ensuing chaos, one adult female was killed and one of the sub-adult females was killed. Junior's now reached adult status and wandered off all on his own and leaving behind one remaining sub-adult. So the Inkahuma Pride at the moment is five lions strong, four adults, one sub-adult female. The one adult is currently occupied elsewhere. I believe she was last seen on Inkoro, although she might be on Torchwood now, mating with one of the Birmingham boys. 
It's nice to see them so relaxed again. Now the missing lioness has been missing for a while now. I think it's probably about a week, po probably to the point that she's finished with her Birmingham boy um, distraction. But Kristen was wondering, will she stay with the males until a baby is born? Why is she still with them? And I think there could be a couple of reasons for that. In answer to that, no, she won't. They have a three month gestation period and at some point, probably fairly soon, she is going to, there you can see that's the sub-adult. You can see she's a little bit younger, a little bit smaller, still retaining some of that cub-like look. But yes, the female will wander back to the rest of the pride at some point. It could be that she's sticking with the Birmingham boys because she isn't sure where the rest of the pride is and might have to relocate through a couple of contact calls, maybe through scent as well. Well, just generally, and I'd love to know exactly how it is that the lionesses move and what determines where they go, apart, of course, from access to food and water. <laughs> One decided that she is uncomfortable. <laughs> Kevin Catfish? Oh, there's that scar. She's obviously had an encounter at some point. Luckily for us, Kevin Catfish's description has given us the hint and we managed to realize what lions look like. So thank you, Kevin. Kevin has said, I told you that's what they look like. There was a period of time in which I'd almost forgotten what lions looked like on the basis that I hadn't seen them for such a long time. Luckily, I'm getting now a solid reminder at least two or three times a week as to what these beautiful creatures look like. And apparently, James Richards is on it once again. And he's put up a wanted poster of the lions, along with the rewards offered, including shenanigans. <laughs> it's wonderful. I'm so glad I can rely on you guys to jump on board with the strange twists and turns that my mind sometimes takes us in. Hey, gorgeous. Keeping a close eye on us. Thanks, Iggy. And, and in an attempt to comfort me, Iggy has said that Brent might have found the lions, but I'm still the Mumba maiden. And I think I must hold the record for the best Mumba sighting so far by sheer good fortune. We have had some incredible sightings, but there is nothing like the excitement of spending a bit of time with Africa's largest predator, especially when they look straight at you like that. It's a very intense feeling. Ladies, you led me on a merry dance this morning, didn't you? Yes, indeed. Looking very comfortable in the middle, in the middle of the road, in the open. <laughs> now, Tony, you're looking at the lions and so often our lion sightings are during the day. I'm just going to reposition so that we've got a nice view of all four of them. Just wander off the road ever so slightly. And hopefully we can get a nice close-up of this lioness's eyes, or at least one of them. <laughs> she, as she looks away disdainfully, as if to say, well, you didn't find me, so you will not look in my eyes. <laughs> hey, gorgeous. There we go. Keep looking this way. Here we go. So Tony has observed that their pupils look incredibly tiny. Here we go, we've got a perfect view with this incredible camera. Oh, we had one. But Tony, you are correct. And the reason is we generally see them either during the day or with, li or with lights shining on them. Now lions, of course, are nocturnal predators. That is their main adaptation. So their night vision is incredible. They've got the reflective layer at the back of the eye the tapetum lucidum, which enhances ambient light and allows them to see on even moonless nights. They will be able to see as well as we can during the day, if maybe in slightly more greys than colours. And so during the day, when there's plenty of light around, those pupils are contracted very, very tightly to prevent 
excessive light and essentially to reduce the glare. You can imagine how it's like having night vision goggles on and then somebody shining a torch into them. They've got to make sure that they're adapted to be able to see in both the daylight and the nighttime. So having small pupils, is that's all the ambient night that, light that they need to let in during the day. Battle scarred, cuts around the face. She's even got a puncture wound on the top of her head that's healed up. These ladies have a serious story to tell over the last few months. And what's incredible about lions, if you think of them, and I think Steph put it the best, if you think of them as guardians of the genetic line, the Inkuhuma pride, as a pride, could have existed for hundreds of years. Sorry, guys, someone's just trying to get hold of me. Standing by. Uh, I get your visual. Can I join you? You're more than welcome. I'm just going to move around a little bit to make space for you. That's okay. I can see them on the back behind you. That's okay. Thanks. Andrew's just coming to join us. But yes, the females as guardians of their lines, guardians of the pride lines, the Nkuma pride could have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, quite possibly, because of course the females stay within their family groups. Hi guys. Hello. How's it, Andrew? Good, good. good. Thanks, Can't believe Brent got there before I did. Been oh, tracking yeah. them all morning. <laughs> anyway, so guardians of the line, imagine how many stories these lionesses have experienced over the hundreds of years that they've been had a genetic line in existence. I'm not sure if that makes sense to you, but it certainly makes sense to me. Most of the three of them have gone to hide in the guari bush itself. I'm just left with the one female lying in the road. Look at that, she's pure belly. <laughs> Enormous. And there's something about lions with battle scars that is always intriguing. Looking at these lionesses, they are, particularly with the Inkahuma family, rather large females. They're very large, in fact. Their feet are absolutely enormous. And Golden King, you were wondering how large can a lion actually get? And the answer to that, there are certain areas where they are larger than others. And as far as I know, the Eastern African lions have the record for the largest ever recorded species. I believe for a male, it was somewhere around the 270 kilogram mark. And that puts it at about, what's that in pounds? About 540 odd pounds maybe a little bit more. And for females, the record sits somewhere around 150 to 170 kilograms, which is absolutely enormous, 300 odd pounds. These lions probably weigh a little bit less, although with their bellies, I would say that they've added a good 10 or 20 kilograms onto their usual body weight. But it depends on the area that you're in, because I think the record for Kruger, which is the area that we're in now, the record male was about 240, so a little bit lighter than the one that was recorded in Tanzania. But of course, that's just the recorded sizes. They could well get bigger. Look at that belly. Maybe this is where all of the flies were coming from, Andrew. We were so close that we were surrounded by the straggler flies flying around our heads this morning. And Caitlin and Kayla, who are watching in Missouri and whose parents actually let them watch our live safari as part of their schooling, which I think is absolutely brilliant. They've sent through questions before. They've often gone looking at their pets' tracks to try and learn a bit about or practice the techniques that we've taught them about tracking in a practical application. Caitlin and Kayla are wondering, when does a cub become a sub-adult and when does a sub-adult become an adult? So generally with the cubs, 
I refer to them as a sub-adult at about a year and a half old. There's different approaches by different organisations or different research organisations. Generally, they're still considered to be cubs at about one, and by about one and a half, they are sub-adults. It's when they start to really look or come close to being adult-sized. <laughs> oh, sneaking in for a quick head rub there. Pushing forward. And that is, you can actually see perfectly how different the sizes are between the sub-adult and the adult. Just look at the difference in the size of their heads. It's not that easy unless you see them right next to each other. She's still young. She's cuddling up to mom, probably mom. And she will become an adult when she mates for the first time, which is about two and a half. And Genevieve, watching these lionesses bond in this manner, and I'm going to try and keep from wobbling the car because every time I move, poor Andrew goes wobbly and that's just because of the super zoom and that's my fault. And there was a question about the social bonding of the cats when they rub each other's, when they rub their heads together, when they socialize in some way, does that release some kind of in, endorphin or hormonal response, for example, oxytocin? And the answer is yes, I think it does. I'm, I'm fairly certain that it does. I haven't read any studies that confirm it, but I would not be at all surprised if that kind of serotonin or oxytocin is released within their brains themselves. It's part of their entire bonding experience. And in this particular case, lion prides are very, very closely bonded. Well, we've found the lions and we've got other exciting things to find. Apparently, Brent has found you probably one of the cutest animals that we get out here. So we heard those elephants trumpet while we were with the lions and we've managed to find them. Unfortunately, they're just across uh, in Sibambili, so they're not the best visuals, but there's a tiny little chap there. Very, very cute. Disappearing is another one about to come into frame to the left. And you can see the branch moving where it's feeding. Hello, Willy Fants. So, we came looking for these elephants. It's also a really good area to look for shadow. A female leopard is dominant on Arethusa, so we've crossed into Arethusa, and we're on the Arethusa Sibambili boundary at the moment. And those elephants are just in Sibambili, but they are slowly mobile east, so I think we'll leave them for now, do a loop around the area, see if we can find uh, some leopard tracks and give them some time to move onto Juma. And while we do that, let's go back to those wonderful felines with Jay. There we go. Continuing on our theme of social bonding, it's most likely mom with her sub-adult giving her a thorough clean. And it's a perfect example. You can really see the, how tightly bonded these, this pair is. Now, the amazing thing about lionesses and the Inkuhumas in particular, although we will never know exactly what happened when that female was killed on Torchwood or with the death of the other sub-adult, we can be fairly certain because these sub-adults were just at the wrong age, they were just that little bit too young, so as to put them within the Birmingham sites as a possible threat, and rather than a mating potential. And I suspect that the Inkahumas reacted the way that they did and fled the way that they did to protect not just this, not just Junior, but also these two young females. Fortunately, they didn't manage for the one. 
but at least they've managed to keep her alive. Wisdom and experience and managing to escape the attentions of the Birminghams. Now the sub-adult has reached the stage where she is safe. The Birmingham boys won't kill her because she will get to come into Eastra soon and they'll be able to mate with her. They just needed to keep her alive for those crucial few months. And you can really see the affection here. This aloe grooming is so essential in both sharing their scent with the other members of the pride and also obviously enhancing those bonds between them. And no matter how scientific you want to be about it, you can't help but interpret this as affection. It is one of those strange facts or approaches of lion's behavior. Blair has asked about it this in British Columbia. It seems so strange that during the takeover, the Birmingham boys killed members of the pride and then the prides go off and pride members go off and mate with them. And it's a strange dichotomy of lion life. It's one of those natural instinctive things. Oh, hairball. <laughs> trying to remove all of the hair that she's managed to collect on her tongue. Blair, it is one of those curious aspects and it all sort of makes sense in our heads now. We've kind of come to the conclusion as to what really happened. But let's go back to the beginning for new viewers. When a lion male is kicked out of his territory, he'll move off or be killed by incoming males. And their approach will then be what is known as infanticide, where they kill the cubs that would have been belonging or sired by the previous male and then mate with the females. Oh, I think I need to shift forward for this. Oh, hold on one moment. I struggle to do that. Oh. Rusty having one of her moments. Okay. In that case, we will sit exactly where we are for now and I'll answer Blair's question because it is a very good one. So the males that come in will kill the cubs of the females and then bring the females back into estrus in that way. They don't want to invest any of their time or energy in raising and looking after cubs that are not their own or at least protecting the territory in which those cubs grow up. So they kill the cubs in order to bring the females back into estrus. The females in response to this, which is a very clever adaptation, will come into what's known as a false estrus because you never know if those incomers are actually going to stick around or if they're going to prove to be or if they're going to be kicked out by other males coming in. So lionesses actually wait for a period of stability before they fall pregnant. And I think we have reached that stage with the Birmingham boys. Now the interesting thing with those males was and particularly with their interactions with the Nkuhuma pride which is what Blair is talking about they came in right at the point where the sub-adult females were, as I said, exactly at the wrong age. They were just that little bit too young, I think, for the Birmingham boys to consider them mating potentials and still think of them as cubs. So they were right at that sort of turning point at which they either would have been safe or in danger. I also think the Birmingham boys' age seriously played a role in it. They were young, they were inexperienced in terms of what they were doing. And they were so pumped full of testosterone and aggression, having had that battle with the Matimbas, that they were on the borderline of aggression the entire time. And I think what probably happened when that female was killed, and probably with the sub-adult as well, is that it was either in defense of one of the sub-adults, or it was an argument over a kill that immediately turned violent because the Birmingham boys, as I said, were so pumped up full of testosterone and aggression in order to effect a takeover. And then immediately the female's response is to placate the males. So that, that's what that false estrus is for. To mate with them, to calm them down essentially, you could almost view it that way. An instinctive way of saying, okay, we accept you as the dominant males. 
And then, after time, if the males prove themselves to be worthy of passing on the genetic line, if they prove to be solid protectors of the rest of the pride, and that is what they will be. The Birmingham boys from certain sectors were villainized for essentially acting instinctively as lions do. They've now established the territory, they're a powerful coalition, and they will prove to be very reliable fathers for the females. Not that they will look after the cubs necessarily, they might be patient with them, but they will provide them with security, meaning that they will protect the lioness's cubs from any other marauding males and keep them out of the territory and provide the females essentially with a secure living environment and some good genetics to pass on to the next generation. And speaking of the next generation, Brent seems to be on a roll with finding little animals to show you, so let's have a look at what he's found now. So, in our search for leopard and elephants, we've come across a giraffe. Now, the reason we're staying and hanging around here is this female has got a really, really small baby. It's also the reason why we staying a little bit further back we can't see the baby right now but hopefully she will show it to us shortly i'd guess probably around a week old still shorter than mom's back legs and just trying to spot it through the bush around her legs i think i can see a bit of movement It's amazing that such a big animal disappears so easily into the surrounding bush. So Christopher in Arizona is wondering what sort of animals can see in color. Our giraffe sees in those monotones, and the animals that see in color out here are a lot of the bird species, as well as the primates, baboons, and monkeys. So I think I'm going to try to reverse a little bit to see if we can get a, a glimpse of that little one. Just make out the little one looking at us through the bush. Look at that. He's so tiny, he can't see over the tops of the bushes yet. So, so small, the little guy there. Unfortunately, not the best visual, but she is a little bit nervous. I, as I said, that, that giraffe calf is very, very new. So we're not going to hang around too long. Sorry, guys, just going to be on the Game Drive channel for a second. Standing by. Firm, uh, Andrew, they were at Sibambili Arethusa cut line, still inside Sibambili. If you go look now, they might have come out onto Triple M. Copy, thanks. 
So we're not going to hang around too long. And while we move off Tam Tam, I was wondering how long can a giraffe's neck get? Well, on the big, big, big males, they can get quite... She's got something else. Now. Sorry, I just, just, let me just look off to the to the north there. No, I think she's just turning her head. Giraffe are very good at spotting predators with that long neck we're chatting about. Uh, but on average, on a, on a female like that, the neck's probably two meters or so. On a big male, it can be sort of three, three and a half meters. soft sand at the junction of the roads. something is when defending themselves or their young against lions. Now a little baby giraffe like that is a, re a real favorite of lions. They, it's big but it's also relatively easy to catch so it comes with quite a lot of food and minimal amount of effort even though the female might really really defend it quite staunchly. systems where she can hide out and uh, maybe we find a track coming in or out and then we're going to loop back towards where those elephants are if we get no luck here hopefully they've moved out and into our traverse area so let's jump on quickly with jamie because those cats are on the move noticed about the females even though we found them lying in the road is that they didn't seem terribly settled I just want to investigate why this one females moved off looks like the amber-eyed female who seems largely to dictate the group's movements oh no sorry it's not that one it's the female with the scar on her back yeah, she might have moved away from the other females just to urinate, which is what I think she might have done. But there you can see old injury that was probably quite severe when it first happened, or at least it would have looked quite severe. Very round bellies. There's def there was definitely a kill in that block at some point yesterday. It managed to unfortunately evade us and probably is now gone towards feeding the hyenas of the hyena clan. Yeah, she's gonna wander back. Okay, just wondering. bit about the size of the lions in answer to that question about what the biggest lion has ever been and I've said that in certain areas they are larger than others but Mark was wondering as a sort of a natural extension of that as I duck around behind bushes to try and reverse back to our lion sighting Mark was wondering are there different species of lion within Africa and Mark no although there are arguments for different subspecies so for example the Kalahari genetic line the southern African genetic line and so on and so forth and then of course the East African lions that tend to be larger and blonder 
is to try and get the best possible view. All right, guys. I have noticed one other thing. All right, goodies. Okay, I'm here. It's okay. I have noticed one thing with the Nkuma Pride is that since they went, we went through quite an extended patch where we didn't see them. And I've noticed they've come back particularly skittish or more so than they used to be. I'm giving them plenty of space that they can feel comfortable. And they just watched me with those wide eyes. Whoop. <laughs> I think it's safe to say they just relaxed. Oh, I think somebody lay down on a thorn. <laughs> that didn't look very comfortable. But yes, I have noticed they're more skittish. Whether or not that's because of their experiences with the Birmingham boys, maybe they just don't feel entirely comfortable anymore. Luckily, it has definitely reaffirmed the bonds between the individuals. They're such incredibly sociable creatures. Oh, bit of a growl there. No, <laughs> sub-adults, you don't fit there. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew and I are laughing. The end product of the digestive process of a lion is the occasional expression of flatulence. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> That's um, eye-wateringly eye bad. That really is quite... Um, <laughs> that was one serious expression of... Um, how do I put it? Intestinal processes at work. But what happened there was it was unexpected and it gave the lions a fright. <laughs> they all jumped. <laughs> I've seen zebras do that. I must admit that's the first time I've ever seen a lion fart and then get a fright. <laughs> very impressive. Thanks very much, ladies. First you run rings around me and then you send that foul stench wafting across in Andrew and my direction. That was truly, truly the final say. I think the lions have had the final say this morning. Look at that. That's awesome. They love each other no matter how smelly they happen to be. That's cool. Tails entwined. Looking very comfortable. And Christopher in Arizona has asked a very good question. Speaking of affection and the social bonds between the animals, you're wondering who do I think shows more affection towards their young? Would it be would it be the lions or would it be the hyenas? And I don't think I could choose. I think that all of the animals, or at least all of the mammal species, show an enormous amount of or the, or the strength of that maternal bond. Lionesses are particularly affectionate. There's a difference in approach, of course, in the way in which spotted hyenas tend to s spend so much time around the den site, particularly when their cubs are so young, whereas lionesses often have to either leave their young or ca keep them trailing with them when they go out hunting, depending on the ages of the cubs. But it's just a different evolutionary tactic. I don't think I could possibly say who shows more affection between lions and hyenas. It's, what I will say is that there's a lot more respect from the other spotted hyenas, so not the mothers, particularly if she is a high-ranking female with high, therefore high-ranking cubs that have inherited her status. The other females tend to be a lot more careful around them. Whereas with lion prides, when you watch them feed, so for example, okay, let's, sorry, to carry on with that thought. So for example, spotted hyena cub at about, let's say eight to 10 months old, going towards a kill, mom is high ranking. The other adults will actually step back from the kill and those hyena cubs will have first access. Whereas with the lionesses, they lactate for a far shorter time than for example, something like a hyena. So it's only a couple of months. And then when the cubs do start to feed at the carcasses, they actually really seriously 
get pushed around. They get, I have seen cubs being swatted from side to side. I've seen them thrown to the ground by the other adults. Nobody seems to really fight for their place at the carcass. They've just got to learn. It's a rough and tumble world if you're a lion cub. Hyenas have got a much more extended period of time with just their mother's attention. And then if they've inherited a high status, then they get first access to the kills. But for any mammal species, that maternal bond is very powerful. You see it within the wildebeest even, and the impala species. I would say strongest maternal bonds are probably those of elephants, and that's partly because of their emotional and social development and the way that their brains are wired, and also the amount of time that they're going to spend looking after those, you, those youngsters. They'll spend, for mothers, they can spend 40 years if a mother lives to 60 and her daughter, her oldest daughter lives to 40, that's the space of 40 years that they've spent together really reaffirming those bonds. And even if the female has other calves, those bonds will still be in place. I think that's probably one of the strongest. Rhino maybe as well, to an extent, just because they also spend about a year and a half with their youngsters before the next, and three years until the next calf is born. Oh, my word, the smell is still wafting gently in our direction. And since the smell is wafting over us and Andrew and I still have watery eyes and the taste in the back of our throats, Anne-Marie was wondering why is lion flatulent and scat smell so much worse than that of the other big cats or the hyenas. And I don't necessarily have an answer for that. I will say leopards does smell really bad, particularly when they first made a kill and that initial uh, defecation after they've eaten something, because usually what they eat fir first is the rich and the oily organs, kidneys and the livers. They tend to go through very quickly and come out with a less than solid consistency. And that is incredibly potently smelly, if not as smelly as the lions. I think it's just because the lions are bigger that their scat has such a powerful impact. And there's more of them, of course. And usually around a kill site, they tend to move off a little way and defecate and then come back. So you always run the risk when you're moving around a kill. Whereas with leopards, it's one individual, they're a bit smaller. You run less of a chance of encountering it. As for why the flatulence is so bad compared to hyenas, my only suggestion, and I could be wrong about this, but my only suggestion is that maybe hyenas' digestive systems are a bit more efficient. Oh, here we go again. That was a silent, deadly one. <coughs> Andrew's, Andrew's hiding his face in his shirt, <laughs> or attempting to. He's now putting his buff on his face. <laughs> yeah, they found them on Impala. I must say, that's, um, they, I think, Anna Marie, that they are worse. I couldn't tell you exactly why that is, though. These lionesses in particular are producing something of potent quality, possibly tear gas. In fact, I think that bioengineers should possibly think about marketing mm -hmm. this particular scent as a anti-protest technique or an anti-riot technique because it is really quite, I mean, it will stop you in your tracks. <laughs> I certainly have no desire to be any closer than we are. <laughs> there you go. Andrew's, Andrew's found a way of avoiding it. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm less fortunate. I don't think I can get away with that. I'll just um, speak through my shoulder. You smelly lions. Yes. At least they're well fed, I suppose. Very good point. This LARP has raised a very valid point as the wind blows it in the direction. This LARP has said that then I shouldn't really be sitting. Was that another one? Oh no. That I shouldn't really be sitting downwind of them. And that is a very valid point, Liz Lapa. Um, however, upwind of them is a thorough thicket of guari bushes. And so for your viewing pleasure, I have decided to sit downwind of them and since it's the only view of them that we have. <laughs> she has a bit of a bath. I don't know, Andrew, should we go sit upwind? We'll look at, look at the lions through the guari bushes. Mm. <laughs> and as she has a really good clean, 
Marcel has noticed that the lionesses actually have faint spots when we see them in the sun. And the most clearly that you will see it, unfortunately she's hiding away at the moment, but you'll see that most clearly on the sub-adult. And Marcel, lions do have spots around them. Generally they tend to fade with age. The cubs are born not spotty like a leopard cub, spotty, but they are born with spots. It's a way of enhancing their camouflage, particularly, as I said, since mothers often need to leave them hiding away when they're young. It's a way of just keeping them adding a little bit to their protection. And those spots over time will start to fade, but they're most commonly seen around the belly area. Unfortunately, not terribly clear in this particular light. Sleepy cats with very full bellies, looking incredibly comfortable. So let's pop over, get an update from Brent, and I will be back with you shortly. So no luck yet, but we are checking in the area. It doesn't look like anyone's checked here for a few days, so hopefully we find some tracks of either shadow or even possibly the Anderson male. No luck so far. I was just saying to Brian, I'm going to go take a road we never take. Maybe that's going to be the, the winning combination today. So we've checked the Murakini drainage, nothing happening there. So we're going to head up and then check the western sections of the Murakini up towards the boundary with Juma, where those elephants were out and about. And hopefully they have popped out onto either triple M or even hopefully moved into Juma. So Kuba Waller is wondering what part of South Africa do the Bushmen live? Is it Namibia? Well, they live in both Namibia and uh, South Africa, as well as Botswana and southern Angola. But historically, about 10 to 15,000 years ago, the Bushmen lived throughout South Africa, Namibia, and Botswana. And only when the Nguni tribes migrated from up north, they then pushed uh, the Bushmen into the deserts. So the Bushmen used to live everywhere. They would have lived here. Um, and there are Bushman paintings on the hills around here, but only about 10, 15,000 years ago when the Nguni tribes, so your Zulu, Osa, Tswana, uh, Venda, Ndavene, etc., moved down from up north, did they actually push the Bushmen into the great desert areas, in the areas that they didn't uh, want for themselves. Oh, The reason we're checking this area, the shadow hasn't been seen in a while, and a lot of the, the blocks between the roads here are almost completely inaccessible by vehicle. So if she has um, had cubs, or is preparing to have cubs, it's a great area for her to come and, and set up shop. Also, quite good distance from hyena dens. The Nkormas have been spending a bit of time in this area, but not too much. close to the area, speaking of cats, that Brian and I were lucky enough to catch the first serval ever on live drive. So I definitely say if we can't find a leopard, I wouldn't say no to a serval. very seldom or I very seldom ever drive but while we check through here let's go back to Jamie who's got big cats on the move the good news is we have prospects of an upwind sighting as opposed to a downwind the ladies have just got up 
and decided to move to a, a different patch of shade. As I said earlier, they are not as comfortable as the Inkahumas that I knew when I first started working here. So I'm giving them plenty of personal space, I'm not following up right behind. Let's see if we can get a nice view of them. They've gone right into a guari thicket. We might have to go around. Hello, girls. Do you mind if I come say hello? Luckily, there's a nice open clearing. Just bear with me one moment. We're gonna go around them, give them some space. There's one female in particular. It's the female with the injury across her back and the scar that's healed up. She is particularly vigilant. And although we chuckled at the flatulent reaction where they all got a fright and jumped up, it's actually a sign of the fact that they're not feeling comfortable, whether or not it's because they got kicked off that kill last night by the hyenas. Maybe you just, as we've always, we've always said, they're wild animals and you never know what's happened in their lives before you see them. So no matter how well you know them, you never know how or what they've been going through the night before. So it's important to read their body language and never get blasé or, or make assumptions. What's up, ladies? I'm just gonna stop here for the moment. I just wanna let them relax with us a bit. Definitely the female with the scar. I think it's the one on the right there that's looking at us. She's been the most uncomfortable. And even the gentlest tail flicks suggest to me that she's Hmm, not very relaxed. Both Amber Eyes and that older female have been keeping a very, very close eye on us. And who knows, it could be the calls of other lions that set them on edge. It could be anything. It's just important to read the body language messages that they're sending us. There we go, nice and relaxed again. That female still Keeping an eye on us. There we go, they're still mating. Just an update that's come through from Craig. The female is still mating with the Birmingham boys. That's a wonderful message that we've received from a new viewer. It's okay, girls, it's all right. You're okay. Just gonna sit here, let them calm down a little bit. And Jan, Jan Bradford is a new viewer who is watching all the way in Ohio, and this is his second evening watching since he discovered the show. And he's, Sorry, it was Don Bradford. Don Bradford watching and absolutely loving it. And he sent us a big thank you. Don, it's an absolute pleasure. Nothing brings us more joy than spending time in the way that we get to with these incredible animals. But also, there's one thing that you'll find that unites all guides, and that's the fact that we love to share it with other people. We love to share the love that we have for the places and the animals. It brings it a whole new aspect to the lives that we lead in the bush. So it's a pleasure, yeah? Don, you don't need to thank us. Just tell your friends, send through your questions. Let us know how you feel and any comments that you have to make and we'll be thrilled to hear it. And for those of you joining us for the first time, or similar to Don, and you want to know how you can ask questions, you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. We do love to hear from you. Now, when you do email through the questions, we will send through an automated reply, just to let you know that we have received them. That comes through to you automatically. And we do, I promise you, we read every single question that comes through.
Hello, gorgeous. There we go. Bit more relaxed now. I think there is a chance that they were disrupted from their kill last night. Maybe the hyenas got there. It would be interesting. It's one of those fascinating things about coming out first thing in the morning is that you really get to unravel the mysteries of the night before. <laughs> Even if it takes a little bit longer than expected. And these extraordinary cats are a perfect example of millions of years of evolutionary perfection, creating a living, breathing hunting machine. And Blaine would like to know a little bit more about the tools of the trade that the lions have to offer. He wants to know how long can a claw grow? And Blaine, I've been fortunate enough to have a look at the paws of lions and I have actually encountered a lion skeleton, a lion that died of natural causes, so I had a long look at those incredible structures that are the claws. They're tucked away now in the sheath to protect them from being blunted on the ground while they walk and to stop them from getting covered in dirt. But hidden within those enormous feet are very powerful, very long claws. And Blaine, if you curve your thumb, and have a look at the size of that. Presumably, with sort of the average man's hand, the dew claw of a lion is about that length. Thick and incredibly powerful. <laughs> I love it when lions do that. They go and lie on top of each other and then get cross. And there's just a sort of a gentle growl. As if to say, hey, you're kind of lying on me. And then what's always entertaining with that is that the offending lion that's invaded the other's personal space then growls back as if to say, listen, I'm coming to cuddle and you just have to deal with it. Oh. Why? <laughs> Don't chew the buffalo thorn. That's very silly. Okay. That's a strange approach to the morning. She's now, I mean, buffalo thorns are one of the thorniest trees that we have out here. They've got sharp, tiny little dagger thorns. So why she's decided to nibble on the branch, I have to admit, escapes me. And every now and again, she makes that face as if to clear a thorn out of her mouth or the delicate lining of her gums. Maybe she's got a sore tooth is one option. Maybe she's just idly entertaining herself is another. One of those weird aspects of lion behavior, I'm not entirely sure what she's doing. Now, of course, like domestic cats and dogs, lions will eat grass, and all predators will do it, actually. They will eat grass, especially when they have upset stomachs or they've eaten something that disagrees with them, which actually is a lot of the time. They very often are uncom feeling uncomfortable in the gastric department. But I don't know, I've never really seen one nibble on a buffalo thorn before. Maybe she just lay on it and it made her uncomfortable. Oh. And that's sort of what I was meaning by when they lie on top of each other and get irritated. <laughs> and that was. There was absolutely no real aggression there, as you can see, as they've settled down again, finding the, uh, that buffalo thorn girl just won't, just won't let you rest. Maybe she's trying to find a good way of moving it. Another line is coming to investigate the noise. And a big hello to Logan, Charlotte, Diane, who are all Caitlin and Kayla's friends. 
and are watching as well, which is fantastic news. I'm very glad to hear it. And, and Eli and Caleb as well, apparently. You guys are all watching and have been introduced to Safari Live. A big warm welcome. I hope you stay with us and keep watching because everything, every day is exciting and every day is new and different. Even when it's lions just scrapping with each other over the best light or the best position in the shade. That female's very restless, it's interesting. <laughs> and Amber Eyes has seemed to have lost interest in her buffalo thorn. Marcel has suggested that when there's no buffalo, you make do with a buffalo thorn. <laughs> Maybe that is just what she's doing. I think, as far as I know, buffalo thorns do have pain-killing properties within their bark. Not very powerful, but I know that it has been utilized as a painkiller. Generally not the dried out old twigs though. I think she just lay down on it and it was bugging her. And once again, we're left with only three females with the other one moved off into a different patch of shade. Now oh, guys, I'm going to send you across to Brent for an update while we do a quick camera battery change and we'll catch up with you in just a few moments. So not a sign of a leopard anywhere in this northwestern corner of Arethusa. So I'm gonna head back to where those elephants were heading east towards Juma from Sibambili and hopefully we'll have some eddies. I really want to get a nice good visual of one of that little baby that was playing around under mom's belly that we could barely make out through the bush. to find out where we, those Ellie's were. That's the Arethusa game drive radio here there. Yeah. It's almost like, what would you say, Brian? Deciphering ancient Egyptian uh, with that amount of <laughs> that we hear on that. see an adult around and it's definitely not the same one we saw earlier. He almost still looks a little wobbly on his feet. Ah, there's, a, there's mom off to the right. And we're not going to go in there or, or push them too far. They tend to be a little bit nervous with very young, young babies. I'm just trying to see, can you see mom, Brian? Right behind the bush. And it's amazing how an animal that size disappears. You can just see her camouflage there. There she is. Yeah, and we won't spend too much time. That's awesome. Two new little baby giraffes. stopped here. I know it's just a, a wild flower and I know a lot of you love the wild flowers and we haven't got too many good ones this year. 
So this sun is actually normally in a normal wet season one of the most common of the wild flowers and very, very beautiful. Not much medicinal uses or anything like that, but it's called a blue haze is its English name, or an evolvus is its scientific name. If I turn, let's have a look so you can have a look into that flower. Really, really pretty. The blue haze, and it always grows on disturbed soils. So on the edge of, ooh, here we go, on the edge of roads, fire breaks, an area where areas where animals have fed extensively. So sort of disturbed soils. A lot of our wildflowers tend to like those disturbed soils. And like lots of the wild flowers here, it is it is only around for a few months of the year and disappears almost completely during winter. Now let's go see if we can find those elephants. Very successful drive so far to baby giraffe. The Inkahuma Pride. Not the best view of Ellie's. We're hoping to rectify that. And uh, of course, a lovely blue flower. Sometimes the fires are actually less dangerous because there's no grass to burn to actually ignite that intense heat. So I think we should be okay. And also, must remember, a lot of fires out in Africa are controlled burns uh, they, to emulate wildfires, but with a bit more uh, control, obviously. But uh, Africa, most of Africa outside of the rainforest and desert regions uh, is what you would call a fire climax biome. So it actually needs fire, and fire is very good for it. So a lot of uh, trees and grass species climax, so grow and seed at, at a much better rate after a fire and a bit of rain. And if you don't burn for too long, you get a lot of moribund vegetation, lots of dead grass and long grass that's very unpalatable to most of the animals. Most animals like short grass, much tastier, much sweeter, higher carbohydrate levels. And as soon as it gets sort of tall and starts to fade, it becomes almost, it has almost zero nutrients. You can almost, the great example that a lot of the sort of uh, animal science students use, and they obviously study quite a lot of that for farming, grasses are very important, is that you can literally put a cow in a massive field of tall grass and it'll die because there's almost zero nutrients in it.
just to update you guys, those lions we heard during our opening this morning was all five Birmingham boys together with one pink Puma lioness and they line up not too far away from where we were sitting when we heard them. So fingers crossed, either on the sunset safari or tomorrow's sunrise safari, they decide to come pay a Juma and a visit. One of our zoomies, Jody, who's in New Mexico. And if I remember correctly, I think the Jaguar was spotted in New Mexico recently, or was it Arizona? I'm not 100% sure. But great to see that those big cats are moving back into uh, the United States of America from Mexico, reclaiming some of their territory that they've lost to people over the years. But Jody's wondering how long does it take for uh, um, baby giraffe's umbilical cord to fall off? Uh, and it completely depends. Sometimes it can fall off within hours, sometimes a couple of days. Probably not more than a week or two weeks at the longest. Uh, that little bit of umbilical cord will stay attached. But uh, while we continue on, it doesn't look like the Ellies have come out. They might have headed towards uh, a waterhole that's in Simbambili. So we're going to go loop around, head towards a different waterhole. Hopefully we find some Ellies there. But while we do that, let's jump back on board with Jamie and the Informers. While Brent heads out on his pachyderm search, our lions are still quite comfortably cuddled together. And we've got a nice view of the spots on the sub-adult female. And we were talking about it earlier, and it's slightly clearer in this light. So Marcel, you were asking about, you've no, or that you'd noticed that there were spots that you could see on the lions. It's much clearer on the sub-adult, although the, the adults do have faint remnants of them. But there you can see what Marcel was talking about, the spottiness, especially around their legs and their bellies. And that's one of the things that sets her apart as a sub-adult, although she is right at the cusp of becoming a fully-fledged adult, she's already very much involved in their hunts and a crucial member of the Pride. Whoop. They might be skittish as well because the wind is blowing. You can see that Amber Eyes' attention was, something caught her attention. Well, not for long though. Now it would be interesting to know, I'm not sure which one was missing. So as I said when I first entered the sighting, it's nice to see four of them together. Prior to this we only saw three. And the fourth one magically disappeared off for a while and then returned to the group. And it's going to be one of those enduring mysteries. We will probably never know where she went off to. She wasn't, as far as we know, she wasn't mating with one of the males. And in fact, her absence, I don't think, was long enough for her to have been mating with one of the males. Unless she tagged out with the other lioness that was mating with the Birmingham boys. That's a possibility. Maybe it's a different lioness that is still mating. And they just swapped through. Also very possible, lionesses do try to sync up their estrus cycles, or not necessarily try to, but physiologically their estrus cycles tend to coincide. And generally their birth rates will as well, or their birth times. And the reason behind that is it's essentially safety in numbers, and it makes sense to have the females have their babies at the same time. And a different to spotted hyenas, having had that conversation about who is more caring or who looks shows more affection to their babies what is interesting about lionesses is that they will allosuckle so there are recorded cases where the female will feed the cubs of another female so it's one of the reasons why it makes sense for them to have their babies at the same time just a theory i have no idea whether or not they did swap out with the birmingham boys If that is the case, 
and we are to be expecting the pitter-patter of little tiny feet in about three months' time. Nick Jones was wondering what happens from there. So he was saying the lionesses will look after the babies and the males stay out of the picture, and you're wondering if that is correct. Essentially, yes. They don't really in any way play much in the role of actively looking after the youngsters. They will tolerate them, certainly, especially if they believe the cubs, well, only if they believe the cubs to be theirs. They'll allow the cubs, if they're hanging out with the females, they'll allow the cubs to play with them, sometimes let them crawl over their manes, catch and bite their tails, exhibiting a very tolerant behaviour. That being said, they're not above giving them a good solid cuff across the ears if they do get a little bit too irritating. And of course for the females, having the males around is an interesting one because although they, if they will have to give the main portion of their kill to the male, the male fights them off and essentially takes most of it for himself. At the same time, having a male around is good protection against something like a, an invading clan of hyenas that might want to steal the food. But essentially the, the lion's job, the male's job, is not to actively look after the youngsters, that he can leave to the females. His job is to constantly patrol the territory, constantly call, and occasionally steal the lioness's food, but really his job is to keep other males from coming in and killing those cubs. So although we often think of the males as lazy creatures, they very often still don't participate all that often in the hunts, although they do for bigger animals. Um, it's not actually the case. Their job is incredibly physically demanding. They can walk vast distances, especially at night, and cover huge ground. Um, so that's all part of their where they utilize their energy. They also, because they're bigger, bulkier, they've got that thick mane around their neck. For the hunting process, they only really join in at the end because they overheat far faster than the, the more agile, the slender females do. Not that these ladies could be described as slender at the moment, although it is wonderful to see them looking. I must say, this is the last few weeks since the Inkahumas have come back to Juma. I think this is probably the healthiest I've seen them look. Their wounds have all healed up. They've put on plenty of weight. They've got full bellies 80% of the time that we see them. So it's nice to view that now. A pile of lions. Well, the wonderful news is that Brent was on an elephant search and apparently he has managed to locate them. So let's pop over to Sydney's dam and check them out. So, yay elephants! And instinct is correct. Warm, dry day and the Ellies have made their way towards some water. I'm hoping that they move towards us after they finish their drink and they're busy giving notice that one lift her head slightly she was giving a, a wildebeest an evil eye and that same lone wildebeest bull we saw at this very spot with a herd of elephants on the sunset safari and there looks to be more elephants coming another herd coming in to drink behind them you can just see over the dam wall i can see some flapping ears coming through wildebeests deciding to get out of dodge in case those ellies decide to chase them. And there's some water back there as well. There we go. See, it looks like another nice herd coming across the top of the dam. And hopefully this herd makes its way towards us. So they are going to be moving big distances at this time of the year. Or not at this time of the year normally, but with this current water and food situation. And they do need to eat massive amounts of food. An elephant cow probably needs to eat 150, 160 kilograms of vegetable matter in a day. So yeah, I'm just gonna call this on the radio. To Thumbies and Love at Sydney's Dam. So it looks like they're gonna head off into the Combritum woodland to spread out and start feeding. Unfortunately, they're not beelining towards us as I was, ho I was hoping they might. Could change their direction. But if we let them disappear, we look at those other Ellie's about to cross the damn wall. So 
Now, this is a man-made water hole. That's why it's a dam. You can see the elephants move around the dam wall, and Bear was wondering that. Oh, look at them. It's amazing. They, I love it when they go down a hill. They sort of can't. Look at that little guy. Oh, he's excited. There's water. Let's put the speed on. And I love that water walk as they approach water. They get so excited. You see how they just sort of start moving a little bit faster, rushing towards the water. Nice big herd. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, maybe 20, 22 in there. Couldn't see all the little ones through the legs. And there's still a young bull coming up from the rear. I should join them shortly, walk into shot. Such a nice visual. Sometimes it's quite nice to sit a little bit further away and actually get a bit of the sort of atmosphere around. I can't help but snap a picture or two and we can see some kudu walking into frame now. Also probably on their way to have a drink. Snap, snap, you're hearing, don't worry. It's not anything broken, it's just my camera. Those could almost look like they've spotted something where we can't see. They're looking quite intently. And what we want to hear is them start barking. Then that means there's a predator there. But any little bit of movement, it could be another animal that they've spotted. They'll double check to make sure it's not a lion or a leopard and it looks like they're no longer perturbed with whatever's on around the corner. Could be some impala, could be a water buck, could be some wildebeest, could even be another could you. Guys, keep an eye on the Juma Dam Cam as it gets warmer today. Hopefully, there's be some Ellie herds that come to visit that waterhole as well. Question from Motor City, Detroit. Shell would like to know, can elephants swim? Most definitely, Shell. They're actually very good swimmers. And I've seen them completely submerged with only their trunks sticking out while they cross large rivers such as the Zambezi or Chobe. So they are very good swimmers for big animals like that. And quite often they do enjoy swimming. I don't think this water hole is deep enough for them to swim in at the moment, but they might wallow about in it for fun, specifically those eddy bulls, they quite often like to have a good swim to cool off. can hold up to about eight liters of water in its trunk at one time. And you can see in the foreground we've got some virtual starlings as well, some cattle egrets. And Micah was wondering what those white birds are, and from here they look to be cattle egrets. Um, not little, they look too, too small to be little, and that's a little bit of a conundrum in itself. So the smallest egret species we get is a cattle egret. 
uh, and that looks to be the cattle egrets and then the second smallest is a little and then we get an intermediate and finally a great so i'm hoping one of those young bulls decides to have a, a splish splash Waller saying, isn't it nice to see a large herd of Ellie's? I'm with you 100% there. And nice to see them drinking. And especially since they have to travel such big distances between food and water. An elephant can drink about 100 litres of water a day. Now I'm trying to convert that into gallons for you. I know four and a half litres is one gallon. So 45 litres is 10 gallons, 90 is 20, so just over 20 gallons of water a day for one elephant. Now Tag's wondering, did the first herd leave because they saw a second herd coming? Tag, I, I, probably not. I think they had finished their drinking and uh, they were moving off to go feed. So I don't think it's anything to do with the second herd arriving, their movement. There's a tiny little gun in there. So it looks like these Ellie's are also going to do a very similar route to the last group and head off to go feed in the mixed woodland that's behind this waterhole made up mostly of combretums or bush willows, a dominant tree species here in the Sabi Sands. But what an exciting sunrise safari it's been and lots of sightings, lots of good general game, and of course, the Inkahuma Pride. So really, really, really great. And don't forget to join us on the Sunset Safari. It's gonna be the J&J &J team, uh, James and Jamie, and they'll be looking after you, and I'll only be back the next morning, but I'll probably be out on tracking team, seeing what else I can find. So as these elephants depart, we're gonna do the same and let you spend the last few minutes of drive with the lions.